better, President Lincoln wrote this. If I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others the same, I would also do that. So in actuality, the Civil War could have ended in a number of different ways. Now, me personally, what I think determines the outcome of events like the Civil War or other historical events are the actions of individuals. And I don't just mean individuals like the President or politicians in Congress. I mean individuals just like you and me. Individuals like our ancestors and individuals like those that will come after us whenever we're all long gone. So today, especially on the 4th of July, I'd like to consider the individual. Consider how their actions, no matter how seemingly small at the time, played a role in crafting not only a personal history or a family history, but the history of our nation as a whole. Consider whether or not those individuals are aware at the time of them making these decisions of the impact that they will have on crafting what we like to call the American story. So today, please consider the individual. With that being said, let's start to talk about some history here. So it's April 12, 1861. The first shots of the American Civil War happened here at Fort Sumter. And before I can talk about that, I have to talk about something else, though. It happened about 50 years earlier. It's called the War of 1812. More specifically, in the year 1814, the English are going to sail their fleet up the Chesapeake Bay into the harbor there, land their sailors and soldiers outside of our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And they'll find that city so lightly defended they would have stormed through and burned the White House and the Capitol building down to the ground. Now, President James Madison, his wife Dolly, and their one son are just barely able to escape that city as the British come marching through. When that war ends in 1814 in an American victory, President Madison decides that we need a series of fortifications built along our Atlantic coast, the Gulf Coast, and even as far out as the West Coast to protect our nation's harbor cities and coastal cities. So he commissions what's known as the Third American System of Coastal Defense, of which Fort Sumter here belongs to. Now, construction of this fort will begin in 1829. As you may have noticed on your boat ride in today, that we're sitting smack dab in the middle of Charleston Harbor. If we were standing where we are today, in 1829, we'd all be under about eight feet or so of water. So before they can build this island, they're first going to have, or before they can build this fort, they're first going to have to construct an island. In order to do so, they're going to quarry about 70,000 tons of rock from the New England area, as far north as Penobscot Bay, Maine, practically Canada, sail it down the Atlantic coast and into Charleston Harbor. What is the job of enslaved individuals laboring all by hand to throw a boulder after boulder weighing between 50 and 500 pounds overboard? And that work will take them about 15 years to complete. When they've finished, they've constructed an island about two and a half acres in size, which the port currently still sits on today. As you were walking in, you might have thought to yourself, man, this is not a very impressive slaves. port. And today you'd be right. But today we're actually only looking at about one third of the original height of this structure. If you look up at the flagpole here, you'll see a red stripe. That red stripe is about 50 feet from a low tide. Basically. From that ground area where we walked in on, red stripe 50 feet. That's how high these walls were at the start of the American Civil War. So we can only see the first story. There would have been a second and a third story as well. As you look around this fort later on as you're going on the parade ground, you'll notice this fort's constructed of bricks. Millions and millions of bricks are used in the construction of this fort. I've seen numbers between four and seven million. I want you to think about that for a second. Because every single one of those bricks is constructed using slave labor. Mostly women, children sometimes are going to four, five, six years old. You can actually still see some of their fingerprints in those bricks today. Well, let's jump ahead. 1860. It's presidential election year. There's a gentleman running under the newly formed Republican Party, and their platform is this, the non-expansion of slavery into the Western territories. Basically what that means is if you're a slaveholding state in the South, you can keep your slaves, you can keep your institution, but any new state admitted to the Union will not be allowed to have slaves residing in it. And this worries states like South Carolina and other slaveholding states, because for the last 50 or so years, there's been a very fragile balance of power in Congress between free states and slave states. Now if free states start to outnumber slave states, Congress could very easily pass a law abolishing slavery altogether, thus destroying the Southern economy and what some throughout this nation view as their God-given right to own other human beings as personal property. Like the second the 1860 election is so important to Americans at the time, nearly 82% of eligible Americans will turn out to vote in that election. It's the highest voter turnout at the time and still the second highest to date. And that gentleman, running under the Republican Party, he will win. Brings us to the pop my section no of my speech today. 40%. Who out there knows who wins the 1860 election? Let's go ahead and yell it out, folks. Lincoln. Lincoln. Great, great. I've had some votes where people say nothing, and I get very, very nervous at that. <coughs> Abraham Lincoln will win that 1860 election. Now, he'll win it with less than 40% of the popular vote. Going by that number, he's the second least popular president in American history. 
but he cleans up in the Electoral College, and that's why we decide things. So he wins. <laughs> about a month and a half later, on December 20th, 1860, South Carolina will become the first state to secede from the Union. And in their articles of session, among a number of other different reasons, one of them looked that those state is this, the election of a president hostile to the institution of slavery. Okay. They leave the Union, and over the course of the next few days, militia groups will go around this state, seizing federal property in the name of the newly formed Independent Republic of South Carolina. Now, what do I mean by federal property? I'm talking about things like post offices, courthouses, and yes, military installations. So then across the harbor there, on Sullivan's Island, is Fort Moultrie. My mental name. Man, Major Robert Anderson, and a garrison of about 80 plus federal troops, the entirety of the United States Army in the state of South Carolina. Uh, they're aware of these militia groups going around the state, seizing federal property, and they're afraid Fort Moultrie might be next on their list. So on the night of December 26th, they'll sail across the harbor and enter into Fort Sumter. Well, they'll find a construction crew. Because that's right, 30 plus years later, this fort's only about 80 or 90 percent done, which in my personal opinion is pretty much on target for a federal project. <laughs> but anyways, that next morning, they'll raise an American flag, just like we're getting ready to do here soon. 20 feet tall, 36 feet long. So large you can see from downtown Charleston. And when Charleston wakes up that morning, two days after Christmas, they see that American flag flying over this fort in their harbor. They're none too pleased. Like I said, just seven days prior, they declared themselves the Independent Republic of South Carolina, practicing in their mind the same right to self-determination the 13 colonies had practiced in 1776 when they decided to break away from the English Empire. So they see that American flag flying over this fort. They view that as a flag of an invading force, and they want it taken down. Over the course of the next few months, the governor of South Carolina and a general PGT Beauregard of the newly formed Confederate States of America will ask Anderson and his men to kindly evacuate this fort, leave, turn it over to us, go home, no harm, no foul. Now, Anderson will ignore all of those requests. It's in March of 1861 that Lincoln takes office and he receives word that Anderson's running low on supplies down here. So he decides to send a fleet of ships down here to resupply Anderson. Now, the Confederates, they're aware of that resupply effort. In order to get ahead of that situation, on April 11th of 1861, they'll send another delegation out to this fort, ask Anderson again, evacuate this fort, leave, turn it over to us, but this time, not no harm, no foul. If you do not leave, we'll be forced to fire on you. Major Anderson replies by stating this, I shall await the first shot, and if you do not batter us to pieces, we'll be starved out in a few days. We doesn't have to wait too long for that first shot. So the next morning, April 12th, 4.30 in the morning, a border shell fired from Fort Johnson over on James Island streaks across the harbor, explodes over Fort Sumter. Now, it is the very first shot of the American Civil War, and it serves as a signal to the surrounding Confederate forces, Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island, floating batteries out in Charleston Harbor, That's Fort Johnson on James Island, Island Cummings West. Point Battery Wagner over on Fort Island. Simultaneously, open up fire on Fort Sumter and the men stationed here. That bombardment will last 34 hours, consists of over 3,000 projectiles fired at this fort. Miraculously, though, no one is killed. However, uh, it's during that 34-hour bombardment, a hot shot round, which is exactly what it sounds like, a very heated up cannonball, lodges itself in the officer's force that's going the back wall there, catches that structure on fire. Generally speaking, the fire type of force is pretty bad news. Even more so, say if that fire breaks out, you know where you're still in your gunpowder. The fire gunpowder went combined to get flooded up. So Anderson quickly realizes that he pulls his men off those cannonballs and sealing up that powder magazine, which they're successful in doing. So, so good news is, no massive explosion today. Bad news is, though, they just sealed off their gunpowder. And you can't fire back without gunpowder, folks. So the Confederates, they realize a few things. They see smoke billing out of this fort, a lack of return fire. It's April 13th now of 1861. They'll send another delegation back over to Anderson, offer them the same terms they offered on the 11th, evacuate this fort, or we'll continue to fire on you. And Anderson thinks to himself a few different things. Low on supplies, low on food. There's a fire inside of my fort. I can't even shoot back, and I haven't lost a man yet. So yeah, I think now is probably a pretty good time to evacuate this fort. But before we do so, we'd like to lower our flag, complete with a 100-gun salute. You better say, yeah, sure, go for it. So the next day, April 14th, 1861, they'll conduct that flag lowering ceremony. But unfortunately, on the 47th round, a gun prematurely discharges, instantly kills a private Daniel Howe, mortally wounds another private Edward Galloway. <laughs> the death of these two men marked the first death in the American Civil War, a war that will go on to last four years, involve over three million men on both sides, cost over 700,000 of them their very lives, oh, and in the balance die. came the fate of over four million enslaved individuals. Now that next day, April 15th, Union forces will be ferried out to that resupply fleet that's been sitting off the coast there since about April 12th, just out of gun range, watching everything go down. They'll hop a U-turn 
head back to New York City, where they received as war heroes. American flags decorate the street, and the flag for the North has changed, no longer just a symbol of a government organization or a military operation. It now stands for what we most, like most of us here consider today, a symbol of liberty and justice for all. Down here in the South, they'll raise their Confederate flag over Fort Sumter, where it'll fly for the next four years, until February 17th of 1865. It's on that day they'll abandon this fort because they've, under, they've uh, caught news of General Sherman who's finished his march from Atlanta to Savannah and is now headed north to Columbia, the state capital of South Carolina. Now with these forts walls two-thirds of the way destroyed from a Union bombardment between 1863 and 1865, they feel that they can better serve their cause, not here in Charleston, but north in Columbia. So they'll abandon this fort. The next day, February 18th of 1865, Union forces will re-enter this fort raise the American flag that they took down four years prior, not known if it would ever fly over this fort, any other fort, or any other building across this nation ever again. Two months later, on April 9th, 1865, the American Civil War comes to an end. And five days after that, Except Major Robert Anderson, Washington now retired, come back to this fort, raised the same flag that he took down four years ago in an end of the war ceremony. Now, not a lot of people remember that, though, because on April 14th of 1865, Abraham Lincoln decides to go see a theater, a show at the theater. He never really comes back from that show. Now, earlier today, in my speech, I asked you guys to consider the individual. And I want to take that thought experiment one step farther. Let's try to fit ourselves into how a person living in, say, the 1860s or 1850s would have thought when viewing the flag. Let's say you're a uh, prosperous slave owner in the city of Charleston. It's December 27th. 1861 or 1860. Anderson and his men have moved into this fort. You're not quite sure if war's going to start out, or it's going to break out yet, but you're nervous about it. You sit at the very tippy top of the economic and social ladder. And that position might change if war breaks out. You view the American flag as, like I said earlier, a flag of an invading force. You don't want it flying anywhere near your city, and you're proud of your southern heritage. Now, where you're considering all these things, maybe you order a cup of coffee. Who's going to bring that copy to you? Most likely one of your enslaved individuals. So let's consider the perspective of an enslaved individual in 1860. Now they see that American flag probably doesn't really mean too much for them. Because if you've been told that a flag symbolizes justice and liberty for all, except for people who look like you. In 1850, Frederick Douglass said, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. So for an American slave, that flag might not mean much in 1860. But in 1865, it means a lot more. So when the Civil War comes to an end, now you have your liberty and your justice. You're finally free. But what about a soldier in the 1860s, Union or Confederate? You're standing there, sweating in your wool uniform. You might not even quite sure what those flags symbolize, whether it's the South or the North. What I'm getting at today, folks, is that the flag means a lot of different things to different people. Objectively, it's just a piece of cloth. Subjectively, though, that's when it starts to change. The flag, to me, might mean something completely different than it does to any of you out there, and that's perfectly okay. One of the best things about America, in my opinion, is its diversity. I don't mean diversity in the sense of what religion you practice or what color your skin is or where your ancestors are from. I mean the ability to comprehend that all of us have different lives. Just because we grew up differently or came from a different place doesn't mean that any one of us is any better than the other person. Sure, we might disagree, but at the end of the day, we can just agree to disagree. We can do it respectfully, we can do it courteously. Now, we're going to need about 20 or 30 or so volunteers when we start raising the American flag over this fort. Just go ahead, you don't have to raise your hand or anything like that, just come on down. I'm going to need two lines forming up. One right over here, another one right over here. I have some old glory that you live through. I'm going to lift it up and I'm going to just talk to you. Yeah, we're going to stand it shoulder to shoulder. USA. We've got a whole conglomerate of people here. We need two lines, folks. Two lines. God bless America. 